story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. In four months, 15 food markets in your city have been held up and robbed. The bandit is well-dressed, well-armed. Your job, stop him. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So try comparing Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, uh, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, February 12th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 9.48 p.m. when we got to room 25A, interrogation room. Have a chair, Mr. Pollard. Yeah, thanks. Now, uh, what is it that you want to tell us, sir? Well, uh, you have a cigarette, please. Yeah. Here, here you are. Thanks. I'm a little nervous. This never happened to me before. What's that? Well, after I thought it over, I knew it wouldn't be any use to keep it up. I knew you'd find me. I don't think I quite follow you. I want to confess. That's why I came here. Yeah? I knew I was doing wrong. I just couldn't help myself. What have you done? I'm not trying to defend myself. I needed money, that's all. There wasn't anything else I could do. Well, we still don't know what you're talking about, Pollard. You've been after me four months. Thought maybe you'd recognize me from the description. Some of the people must have seen me. Hmm? Those food market holdups. You pulled those robberies by yourself? Yeah, 15 of them. Needed the money. Pollard, is that your true name? That's right, Jeff. Frank Pollard. You ever been arrested before? Drunk charge, that's all. I don't know why I went wrong. I just did. You ever done any big time? No. Well, why do you want to confess? I want to get it off my mind. I want to tell somebody. Everybody. Look, uh... Call in the newspapers. I'll give them a whole story. I'll tell them everything. Uh, how many of those markets did you hold up, Polly? Fifteen. You said you needed the money, is that right? Why? Personal reasons. Now, look, you got a light again. The smoke's out there. Yeah. Here you are. Uh, yeah, thanks. You used pretty much the same routine on all of the holdups, is that right? Yeah, I only pulled one job a week. I figured that was the safest way. Dressed pretty well, like a salesman. Always had a briefcase with me. Is that where you carried a gun? Yeah. Always worked, too. I'd show up at closing time, get the manager in the back room, then pull the heist. What kind of a gun did you use? Service pistol. I had it from when I was in the Army. How do you usually work it? Well, when I got the manager alone in the back office, I'd just pull a gun and I'd say... Give me the money, all of it. They knew I wasn't fooling. They'd give me the dough. You don't seem to fit the hold of man's description too closely. Did you wear a mask on those jobs, did it? Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. How about the man who worked with you? Where's he? It wasn't anybody else, just me. Worked him alone. That's why you cops were wrong. You thought there were two of us, didn't you? We thought so, yeah. Pulled every job by myself. 
That's why I crossed you up. I knew what I was doing. I didn't need any help. Well, how about that market out on West 7th that you held up last night? Did you pull that one alone, too? Yeah, sure. I always work alone. Guess I had you guys going, huh? Your story doesn't come very close. The man we're after doesn't use a service pistol. He never wears a mask, either. What are you guys getting at? I told you I pull those robberies. I ought to know how it happened. I use a service pistol. Did you use it in that robbery last night, the one out on West 7th? Sure, I always use the same gun. Last night was no different. You're wasting time, mister. What do you mean? I Look, I just want to confess. No, sir, there wasn't any robbery last night. On further questioning, the suspect, Frank Pollard, broke down and admitted his confession was a lie. He explained that he wanted the publicity to impress a girlfriend. We had him fingerprinted and delivered him to the Georgia Street Hospital detail. It was filed on and then removed to the psychopathic ward at the county hospital for further examination and treatment. Our four-month-old search for the market bandit went on. In the two weeks that followed, we tracked down more leads. They led nowhere. The real market bandit was still at large. On the night of February 25th, he hit again, this time at a supermarket out on Santa Monica Boulevard. We interviewed the manager, a Mr. Harry Talbot, in his small office at the rear of the store. I guess I should have known better. I got the bulletin you sent out on the guy, his description, everything. I I just wasn't thinking, I guess. He came in the market just before closing time, is that right? Yeah, a couple of minutes after eight. Looked well-dressed, had a briefcase under his arm. I fell for it like the rest of them. I thought he was a salesman. Well, how about the man's description, sir? Uh, about five foot 11, 170 pounds, I guess. Uh, gray suit. It's the same description you had printed up in the paper. Mm -hmm. Was anyone else around when the man came in the door? One of my clerks, Everett Smiley... He saw him leave and get in a car right after the robbery. Is this clerk still around? We'd like to talk to him. Oh, he went down the street a minute. He'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that's him. Yeah? Mr. Talbot, you remember me, Mrs. Bolton? Oh, yes, ma'am. I'd like to ask you a favor, Mr. Talbot, as an old customer. I'm tied up right now, ma'am. Could I see you a little later oh, on? I won't even come in, Mr. Talbot. You see, we're having our annual benefit whist party down at the community church. They were going to have it next Thursday, but I made them put it off another week so we could get some decent prizes. Oh, yes, ma'am. Of course, a lot of our people are good customers of the store here, so I knew you'd be willing to give something to the prize list. Oh, yeah. Shall I put you down for one of the door prizes? Maybe yeah. two or three market baskets full of canned corn, peas, things like that. Yeah, okay, Mrs. Bolton. I'll have Everett fix them up tomorrow. Of course. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Talbot. I'll have my boy Robert pick them up tomorrow. You'll have the baskets fixed up real nice, won't you? Yes, ma'am, I'll take care of it. Well, thank you again. Goodbye. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye. Mr. Talbot, I wonder if you could tell us what happened after you got back here in your office with the hold-up man. Well, it happened pretty fast. He reached into the briefcase he was carrying like he was going to get his order book, and he came up with this gun. He told me to open that safe there. Mm -hmm. But I stalled. I said I didn't know how. I see. And that's when he started telling me what he'd do to my family, my wife, if I didn't open the safe. He knew all about us, my address, my wife's name, my kids. He said he'd get them if I didn't do what I was told. Same M.O. Never failed him. What'd you do then, Talbot? Well, money's not worth that much to me. I opened the safe and gave him everything, a little over $400. I still don't know how he got that information about my family. Do you have any suspicions at all? No, nobody I can think of. How about the gun he had? Can you describe it? Well, just like you have it listed in that bulletin on him. Uh, 38 revolver, blue steel, long barrel. Mm -hmm. hmm. Mr. Talbot. Uh, come on in, Ev. Officers, this is my clerk, Everett Smiley. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Friday and Romero, robbery detail. Mm -hmm. Hi. No. Hello there. Hey, Mr. Talbot says that you saw the hold-up man leaving the market. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. He walked right out of the store and down the street just like nothing happened. I didn't know anything was wrong till later. Did you notice if the men got in the car? Yeah, I did. The car was parked about halfway down the block. Another guy was driving. The motor was running. Did you catch the license number? No, but it was a brand-new sedan. A Pontiac, I think. You shouldn't have much trouble finding it. Without a license number? Well, it's a brand-new car. I remember the color. I couldn't forget that. Yeah? Bright red, just like a fire engine. Ninety percent of the time, color identification of a car means nothing. For one thing, a getaway car can be painted in a matter of a few hours. And for another, the color of a vehicle is not listed on the registration slip. It's impossible to check a car through DMV on color alone. But in this case, we figured that we had half an exception to the rule. The car used in the robbery was new. It was painted a very distinctive color. We began an immediate canvas of automobile dealers throughout the city. After a day and a half of calling and checking, we found two dealers who had sold two new cars within recent weeks with fire engine red paint jobs. 
We got the names and addresses of the purchasers and checked them out. One of them was a Miss Mona Taylor, an ad taker for one of the daily morning papers. I'm sorry to bother you at your work, Miss Taylor. Oh, not at all. Worst of it's over for today. What is it you want to know? Well, we understand that you bought a new Pontiac sedan about three weeks ago. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Uh, if this is about that parking ticket, why, I, I've already taken care of it. No, ma'am, that's not it. We'd just like to know if you still own that car. Well, I don't own it yet. I'm still paying on it. Colors are bright red, is that right? Yes, it is. Fire engine red. I like bright colors. Well, does anyone else besides yourself drive the car, Miss Taylor? Well, yes, once in a while. I lend it to my boyfriend, Al. Al Daly. I've known him for a long time. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. Classified ads, Miss Taylor. Yes, sir. A two-room apartment? Unfurnished? All right. You got a smoke, Steam, Joe. Steam, heat, yeah, just a minute. I got view, on. Beverly Hills. That's it, then. $80. Okay. What's that? Yes, sir. Tomorrow morning's edition. Yes, $2.12 cents for two days. Did I have your name, address, and telephone number? Thank you, sir. About this friend of yours, Miss Taylor, and this Al Daly, how long have you been lending him your car? Since he got his new salesman's job. He has to make night calls on customers out in the valley, so I let him have the car, usually about once a week. When's the last time that he borrowed the car, Miss? Two nights ago. From Mona Taylor, we got the address of her boyfriend, Al Daly. We located him in a rooming house on South Boulevard Avenue. He admitted he borrowed the Taylor girl's car the night before, but he denied that he drove it anywhere in the vicinity of the robbery. How about your friend, Jimmy Bray? I don't know. I loaned the car, that's all. He gave me 30 bucks. Well, that's an awful lot of rental money. Why did he need a car so bad? I don't know. Let's ask him. Where's he stay? Barlett Hotel. Nathan Flower. Mm-hmm. You going over to see him now? That's right. Why? Well, I thought if you were going over there, you wouldn't mind taking this with you. He left it in the car when he brought it back. His briefcase. Let's have a look. What's the matter? It's all a fuss about a briefcase. Yeah? Mm-hmm. What is it? Let's see. All right. You got an answer for that, Daly? Sure. A funny place to keep a gun. We took Al Daly downtown where he was held for questioning. We had a stakeout placed on his rooming house. We had both Daly and Bray checked through R&I. No criminal record. The briefcase and the 38 revolver were booked as evidence with the property clerk. There was no record or prints on the gun. The Taylor girl's car was impounded to be checked for fingerprints. 7 p.m., we drove out to the Bartlett Hotel on 8th and Flower. The room clerk confirmed the fact that Jimmy Bray was a registered guest at the hotel. You want to call the office, Joe? Yeah, yeah. all right, I'll do it. You got change? Yeah, I think I have, Yeah. City Hall. Two five one one. Two five one one. Robbery powers. Joe Friday, John. We're out at Bray's Hotel. We're going to stake it out. He's not in yet. Yeah, that's what I figured. What do you mean? The market out on 12th Street was held up a minute ago. Yeah? Bandit carried a briefcase. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. Buy a pack. You'll find Fatimas now cost the same. Light a Fatima. Ah, that's different. What a difference. Yes, friends, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos, the finest Turkish and domestic varieties, extra mild and superbly blended to give you a much different much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, plump cigarettes rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Quality. Even to the appearance of the bright, clean yellow package. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Try comparing Fatima yourself. Fatima's now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... 
Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Eleven thirty p.m. After checking Bray's room and finding nothing, Ben and I remained on stakeout at the Bartlett Hotel. The suspect failed to show up. At midnight, Young and Mackenzie came out and relieved us. We drove back to the office and got the particulars on the holdup of the Twelfth Street Market. The M.O. was almost exactly the same as in the other sixteen robberies. The victim's description of the holdup man matched perfectly with Bray's. By noon the next day, the suspect still had not returned to his hotel. An intensive canvas of the immediate neighborhood around the Bartlett Hotel netted us nothing. Nobody remembered Bray. We checked the bars and restaurants, but he was known to patronize. No one had any idea where he might be. Details at the airport, railroad stations, and bus terminals were alerted. We got out a supplementary description on our original APB. The sheriff's office was kept advised. Two days passed, still no sign. We questioned and re-questioned Al Daly. Either he couldn't or he wouldn't add anything to what he'd already told us about Bray. A series of stakeouts were placed at food markets in areas where Bray had staged robberies previously. A composite picture of the suspect was made up and given wide distribution throughout the city. It all went for nothing. The following Tuesday, March 4th, Bray robbed a neighborhood market in Highland Park of $150. I had to give him the money, Sergeant. He threatened my wife and kids. Said he'd see something happen to them if I didn't open the safe. Did you say he wore gloves, sir? That's right. I thought it didn't jibe at first. A salesman wearing gloves like that didn't think about it till it was too late. Did you notice if he was on foot or did he get away in a car? He had a car, all right, parked down the street there. Saw it through the window. Another fellow was at the wheel. Mm -hmm. Did you notice anything else about the car, the license number, maybe? No, I couldn't see that, but it was a coupe. I'm sure of that. Yeah? It was red, bright red. It was one angle we couldn't figure. If Bray was bent on a steady career of robbery, why did he use an escape car painted the most conspicuous color possible? We checked out Mona Taylor's car again. There was no connection. The search went on. Two weeks, three weeks, another month. Bray kept to his usual schedule, one robbery a week. The legwork went on, too. On March 20th, we got a call from one of Ben's informants. He told us that he'd seen a man answering Bray's description in the Venice Park amusement area down by the beach. Well, we drove down to Venice to check it out. Pretty good crowd for a cold night. Yeah. Where do we find this friend of yours? See where the merry-go-round is up ahead? Yeah. It's just beyond that. He runs one of the booths. You throw baseballs at phony milk bottles, three chances for a dime, you know. Oh, yeah. He and his wife run it. They've been out here for years. I don't know how they ever make a living, eh? Hey, uh, those hot dogs smell good, don't they? Is that your friend's booth across the way there? Yeah, yeah, I see. Come on, fellas. Tell the girls how you can throw a baseball. Fill the milk. How about it? We'll let the girls have a free throw. Step up and win a prize. Looks like Maud's running the place tonight. Maud, that's his wife. Oh, yeah. How you doing, Sergeant? Cold night, huh? Hi, right, Maud. This is my partner, Joe Friday. How are you? Glad to know you, Joe. Guess you're looking for Scooter, huh? Yeah, is he around? Just down the way, Sarge. Hey, how about it? Say, I'll try your luck. One thin dime. Spill the milk. Pretty good crowd tonight, Maud. Oh, yeah, but they're not spending. Hasn't been good at all lately. Where'd you say your husband was, ma'am? No, just down the way. Old man Hudson's out to Charles. Scooter runs a merry-go-round for him while he eats. Well, thank you, Maud. We'll drop back and see you before we leave. Right. Glad to meet you, Joe. Yeah, glad to meet you. Goodbye. What do you say, girls? Have the boys show you how good they control. Spill the milk. Come on. Scooter, is that what you said? Is that the guy's name? Yeah, that's right. He used to run the scooter drone. You know the little electric cars you drive around? Bumpers all around them? Yeah, yeah. All right. Hey, there he is. Scooter? Hey, Scooter! Oh, hi, Sarge. You've been waiting for you. Hop on. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Okay. How you doing, Sarge? Good to see you. Scooter, my partner, Joe Friday. How are you? Yeah, glad to know you, Joe. I guess we can talk here as well as any place, huh? Sure. What's the story, Scooter? Uh, it's like I told you on the phone. Uh, Murphy down the Penny Arcade, he noticed the guy first. He pointed him out to me. He sure hits close to Bray's description. Well, when did you first see him? Oh, uh, two nights ago. I wasn't so sure it was Bray the first time. And then I, I saw him last night. That cinched it. I didn't hear that. 
I, I say I saw him last night, not that since... Oh, well, when did this Murphy, was that his name? When did he first see him? About a week ago. He, he's got an eagle eye for strangers who hang around. Murphy thinks the guy's staying out here someplace. Is there any idea where? Uh, yeah, uh, just, just a minute. No jumping around like that, son. Now you'll fall off and bang your head. Kids. Where'd you spot this man, Scooter? Same place Murphy did it. He's hanging around the shooting gallery down the way. The guy who runs the place is new. We, we don't know him well enough to ask him about it. You mean this man who looks like Bray just hangs around the counter there? Well, no, no not exactly. You, you see, there's a little office to one side of the shooting gallery, and the times i seen the guy, he was either coming in or going out of there. Mm-hmm. When's the last time you saw him, Scooter? Huh? I say, when's the last time you saw him? Oh, uh, earlier tonight, about 6.30. Uh, yeah, I, I think Murphy's right. The guy's holding up in there. Yeah, d- oh, hold on there, girlie. Now, don't try to get off the merry go round the stops. Yeah, that, that's a girl. Thank you a lot, Scooter. We'll check back with you before we leave. Yeah, okay, Sarge. I hope it helps you out. I'm glad I met you, Joe. Right, see you later. Yeah, there's the shooting gallery down there by the bullseye, son. Yeah, the guy is Bray. It's funny that he hasn't been spotted before. This area is pretty well patrolled here. Yeah. Try your skill, fellas. Ten shots, only quarter. Or police officers like to ask you a few questions. Oh, uh, what about? What's your name? Gridley. Max Gridley. You know anybody by the name of James Bray? Bray? Uh-huh. <laughs> no, I don't. Why? Uh, how about this, Mr. Gridley? You know anybody who fits that description? No. No, it doesn't mean anything to me. What's the matter, anyway? Well, a man answering that description has been seen entering and leaving this office right next door over here. It's part of your concession, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. But I'm the only one who uses it. Somebody must have got the wrong slant. Then you wouldn't mind if we looked it over. Routine investigation. Well, I don't know. Yeah, all right. Come around and open the door for you. All right, come on. It's just a cubby hole, as you can see. I kind of use it as a storage place. Sometimes I have my lunch in here, take a nap once in a while. Looks pretty well lived in. All those clothes are yours, Mr. Gridley? Yeah, that's right. Why? Hey, Mac, how about a loan on this thing? Oh, it's a customer. Excuse me, man. Be right back. Yeah, go ahead. Joe. Hmm? Yeah. Over here, have a look. This towel. Yeah. Look at the name stenciled on it. Bartlett Hotel. 9.30 p.m. We advised the shooting gallery operator not to attempt any phone calls. Then I called the office and Ricketts and Powers came out to help us with a stakeout on the shooting gallery in the adjoining office. Ben and I covered from the Penny Arcade directly opposite the shooting gallery. Ricketts and Powers were staked out two doors away at a stand that advertised handwriting analyzed, 25 cents. We waited. Ben munched on a bag of popcorn. 10.30 p.m., no sign of the suspect. 11 o'clock, still no sign. Mm, Getting pretty cold. Everybody going home? Yeah. You got any more of that popcorn there? Oh, yeah, here you are. A few pieces left. Very good. Must have been. Not much in there now. Oh, I'm sorry. I can get another bag. Machine's right over there. No, turn it off. How about some peanuts? No, no, thanks. Oh, sure there's some in there, Joe. Want some? No. <sighs> sure would like to see Bray show up. Hate to spend the night staked out here. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Look. Huh? The shooting gallery, the guy in the blue suit. He's talking to the manager. He's going around the side door. Yeah, come on. He's going inside. All right, hold it right there, mister. Joe, watch it. Ricketts, Johnny, cover the back. All right, Joe. I'll get the door. All right. Come on, let's hit it. Yeah. Went out the back. Come on. Yeah. Hold it. Johnny's got him. Yeah. Good. Johnny, you okay? Yeah. He's a rough one. Let's roll him over, huh? Yeah, all right. How about it, Joe? Short, dark complexion, fat. What do you think? 
I don't know, but it's not Bray. Ricketts and Powers remained on stakeout at the shooting gallery while Ben and I took the suspect downtown along with the proprietor of the shooting gallery, Max Gridley. We had the man treated for cuts and bruises at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, and then we took him to the office. He identified himself as Blake Chatfield, an unemployed salesman. After two hours of questioning, he broke down and admitted that he was Bray's accomplice. In each of the 18 robberies, he drove the getaway car. He said for the past month, he and Bray had been living in the office adjoining the shooting gallery. He was booked at the New City Jail on suspicion of 211 PC. Max Gridley was held for further questioning. 1.35 a.m., we checked back in at the office. Oh. Guess I had too many hot dogs out there. Yeah, what's the matter? Oh, indigestion. Maybe it was the popcorn. Yeah. A couple of messages in the book. My wife wants you to call her before you go home. Uh-huh. Hello, Amy. Yeah, long night, yeah. What? Loaf of graham bread. Well, I'll try. Okay, then. Yeah, bye. Same old thing. Yeah. I get it. Robbery, Freddy. Johnny Powers, Joe. Yeah, John. How's it going? Jimmy Bray finally showed we got him. Any trouble? No. Drove up in a bright red coupe. Couldn't miss him. Mm-hmm. You coming in now? Yeah, just leave him. See ya. Right, John. Bye. Well, I picked up Bray. Bringing him in now. Good. Sure been a long haul, almost five months. Yeah, it's a long time. Hey, Joe. Yeah? Where am I going to get a loaf of graham bread at this time in the morning? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. For the past few weeks, I've asked you to send me the names of dealers who are out of Fatimas. You see, the demand for Fatimas is so great, I want to make sure that all of you can buy them. So keep on writing. If you find a dealer fresh out of Fatimas, let me know, and we'll have something done about it. Write your dealer's name and address on a card and mail it to me, Jack Webb, Post Office Box 951, Hollywood 28. That's Jack Webb, Post Office Box 951, Hollywood 28. Now a word for you, Mr. Dealer. The coming holiday season will find new thousands insisting on Fatima quality. So step up your orders for Fatima tomorrow. Get in on the increasing demand for the quality long cigarette. James R. Bray and Blake A. Chatfield were tried and convicted on several counts of armed robbery and received sentences as prescribed by law. Max Gridley was filed on for failure to register as an ex-convict. Bray and Chatfield are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. This is Bob Hope. Can we steal a second? Chesterfield, Chesterfield, always wins first place. That milder, mild tobacco never leaves an aftertaste. So open a pack, give them a smell. Then you'll smoke them. Don't forget to give Crosby for Christmas. I mean the Chesterfield Christmas carton with Bing as Papa Santa Claus. See you Tuesday. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Coming up, We the People, then Screen Directors Playhouse on NBC.